Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate, and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs, and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to those of you who showed up early for our first panel, and welcome to you who are watching online. My name is Jan Burton, and you may notice that I'm a pitch, pinch hitter for the moderator who was supposed to be here, Rachel Friend, and she's down with a dreaded disease, so I'm going to try to fill her shoes. Um, I don't know as much as she does uh, about the southern border, but my claim to fame is that I am a Hauser of panelists, and uh, uh, do you remember, more than 10 years ago, Kristen Cinema was the uh, keynote speaker, and she was a House of Rep representative person, and she was very, very sure that they were going to do immigration reform that year, and that's what she spoke about at the keynote. Um, today is April 12th, 2024. It's 9 a.m. This is panel number 17982, and the title is Immigration on the Southern Border. Before we get started, the University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it's located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, faculty, and their work. By educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating indigenous knowledge, and consulting, engaging, and working collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support, and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. The other thing I'd like to mention is that we want to make sure that you get a chance to ask questions. Have, uh, are, is there anyone here who's never been to a panel before? Any? Okay, a few of you. <laughs> um, so we're going to reserve time um, around the middle of the panel discussion for questions. And we do prioritize those questions coming from students. So if you happen to be a student, make sure you make a note of that. And the way we're going to do this is there are two producers here, and they will have note cards and pencils. And if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand, and one of them will approach you, give you a, a note card, and then you let them know when you've, when you've completed it. They'll bring me the questions, and then I will, um, I will be asking the questions of the panelists. All right? Now I'd like to do a brief introduction of each of our panelists. To my direct right is Brandon Warmke, who is the Associate Professor, Professor of Philosophy at Bowling Green State University, and he's also a visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy at the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at CU Boulder. He has published widely on moral, social, and political philosophy and is the co-author of Grandstanding, The Use and Abuse of Moral Talk and Why It's Okay to Mind Your Own Business. He has written many newscasts and publications and is currently writing a book on con conservatism. And to his right is activist and advocate Rebecca Buckwalter Poza, who provides commentary on law politics and policy for web and print media, radio and television. Trained as an attorney, 
She is known for her role as the first named plaintiff in Columbia University's successful First Amendment lawsuit barring President Trump from blocking journalists and other constituents on Twitter. She has worked on progressive campaigns and policy projects on five continents, including as Deputy National Press Secretary of the Democratic National Committee during the 2008 presidential election. And to her right is Lee Bebo, who is a professor, a professor of English at Arizona State University, where he is affiliate faculty with the School of Transborder Studies and the Program in American Studies. He has written multiple articles and two books. His second book, Whiteness on the Border, Mapping the U.S. Racial Immigration in Brown and White, examines how representations of Mexico, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans have been used to foster whiteness and Americanness, or more accurately, whiteness as Americanness. And to his right is Ian Milheiser, who is a senior correspondent at Vox, where he focuses on the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the decline of liberal democracy in the United States. He is a trained attorney and is also the author of two books, on the Supreme Court, including the most recent, The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. It's very important to the Conference on World Affairs that we are able to have mixed points of view and to have those uh, civil discourses in a, in a safe environment, and that is what we've tried to lay out on today's policy, or sorry, on today's panel. And uh, there have been a number of panels on immigration. This one was aimed to be more about policy, but the title is Immigration on the Southern Border, Broken Borders, Shattered Hearts. Is the United States seemingly open border a national security issue or an economic and social phenomenon? I'd like to ask Ian to kick this off with a little bit of history about our policies that have gotten us where we are today. Ian, would you mind doing that? I've heard that there has been a significant rise in the number of migrants arriving at the southern border. So I just want to talk briefly about why that is um, and also why our policy has been you know, struggling to figure out how we want to, how we want to deal with that. So in 2023, the U.S. Border Patrol apprehended more than 2 million people, and that is a huge spike from 10 years ago. In Obama's second term, that, numbered, that number hovered around about 400,000 a year. So that's about a five, time, five times increase. Um, the, reason, the primary reason why this is happening is political instability in Latin America and in the Caribbean. Um, so 20 years ago, southern migration was made up um, almost entirely of men from Mexico. Um, these were people who were coming here because they thought there were better job opportunities in the United States. Um, at least before we tightened down our, Im our immigration laws in the 1990s, they would frequently stay a little while and then return, and, and then return to Mexico. Um, the fact that we make our, made our immigration laws harsher actually led to more people staying in the United States because it meant they no longer had that ability to go, to go back and, and forth anymore. But that's the traditional migrant population, was men who are from the nation of Mexico who are looking for work. Now about half, a little less than half, of our migrants come from other nations in mostly, uh, mostly Central America, but also South America, and we're beginning to see a big, a big spike in Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, these are primarily humanitarian migrants. Mm -hmm. um, they are fleeing countries with very weak states. Um, and like in some cases, there's an individual story to be told about why the state is weak in their particular country. In Haiti, ha Haiti's president was assassinated in um, 2022, um, and they've, you know, they, they, they've struggled to maintain stability s s since then. So there's a different story, and there's a different story in every country. But I think the overarching story is that the pandemic made everything worse. So you you had countries that were already poor that became much poorer with even less economic opportunity because of the disruption caused by the pandemic. 
you also have in many of these countries, I mean, the, the word everyone uses, gangs, but we're not talking about something like, you know, the vice lords in the United States here. Like, we, we are talking about groups that are often able to rival the government for, for, functional, for functional control of the nation. Um, one problem with these criminal gangs is not just that it's very violent, but that it is very hard to find any kind of economic, uh, economic opportunity because the minute you start a business, if it starts to be successful, then one of these gangs will come in and appropriate your profits. Um, and so you have sh a huge humanitarian problem that has grown you know, tremendously dur um, in the post-pandemic era. None of that is the fault of any U.S. policymaker. Um, you know, n none of that has happened because of anything that Donald Trump did. None of this has happened because of anything that, 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 that Joe Biden did. Um, but it is the case that U.S. immigration po laws are not written to deal with this many people arriving at the border. So um, in the United States, you can claim asylum. If, if you arrive at the border. That means that you think that you have a credible th th threat of persecution in, in, in your home country. And the way that that process is supposed to work is you arrive at the border, you say you're claiming asylum, there's supposed to be what is it called an immigration officer there who gives you what is called a credible fear screening. And that's a fairly low bar, but it's not a non-existent bar that you have to, that, 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 that you have to reach. If the immigration officer determines that you have a credible fear of persecution, then you're allowed to stay in the country until you receive a hearing before an immigration judge who will determine whether you actually are entitled to asylum or not. But that process is supposed to take weeks. So it's a, the way it's supposed to work, and the way that it did work when we didn't have this many people arriving at the southern border, was that the immigration officer, that would happen almost immediately. And then the immigration judge hearing would happen, again, in a matter of weeks. The person would stay in the United States for a few weeks. If they were granted asylum, they could stay indefinitely. If they were not granted asylum, then they, then they, would, be, then they would be turned back. And the sheer volume of migrants has just overwhelmed this system. So now people are waiting weeks just for their credible fear screening with an immigration officer, and they're waiting months or sometimes years um, before they have an immigration judge. And again, because the law says you're allowed to stay in the country until you have that immigration judge hearing, you have people who are staying in the country for a very, for a very long time. Um, there was a brief period in the end of the Trump administration, at the beginning of the Biden administration, where this was mitigated because of a policy called Title 42. Title 42 was always illegal. So Title 42 was based on a statute which says that the Centers for Disease Control can control the border to prevent um, the spread of a communicable disease in the United States. And in March of 2020, um, the Trump administration announced that they were invoking this authority because of COVID. Now, the idea that in March of 2020 you could prevent COVID from entering the United States by shutting off, shutting down the Mexican border was already ridiculous. Was always ridiculous. COVID was already in the United States in, in March of 2020, and it became more and more ridiculous with each passing month. You know, the idea that we were somehow preventing COVID from coming to the U.S. by by preventing migrants from coming in, but I think both President Trump and President Biden thought that they wanted some kind of policy mechanism so, um, so that there was some way that they could turn people away at the border. So we maintained this illegal policy until March, or until spring of 2023, when um, the COVID emergency ended and the Biden administration, I mean, at this point you even had Republican judges, Neil Gorsuch wrote an opinion saying there's no way that this is legal. Um, so, uh, you know, at that point, we, we, we could not maintain the fiction that this, that this policy could continue, and that has led to a, to a spike. Um, I will make one last point, because I know I've been talking for a long time, but I will point out that there is a bill that is supposed to deal with this. Um, 
Republicans wanted a bill that would do a lot of things, would increase the number of immigration officers, increase the number of immigration judges to deal with some of the problems I've talked about it. I, 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 I've talked about um, already. Um, it would also give the ability to close the border when the amount of migrants in a particular day exceeded a certain number. Um, and there was initially some resistance from Democrats in Congress. That resistance evaporated when Joe Biden said, no, we are negotiating to get this bill through. They got a bill through. It was ready to pass. The reason why the bill did not pass is because, and I mean, this is, you know, Senator Romney said this on the record, that this is the reason why. The reason why the bill did not pass is because Donald Trump decided that he would rather have an unpopular border crisis than a solution in an election year. And so that is why the bill did not pass that was intended to, de to, de to deal, you know, to, ex to, to give our system more leeway to deal with the, the immigrants that are, that, that, that are coming here. Um, so anyway, that's just my description of the po of the policy and political landscape that that we are dealing with, and I will move on to the other panelists. Thank you so much, Ian. Really appreciate that overview. I think it's very helpful to understand the history of that. And uh, I think we'll just go down the row here, and if uh, Lee, if you could kind of give your perspective on it. Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate Ian's focus on the current migrant situation, the asylee situation. I'm gonna talk about another policy that is also sometimes in the news maybe has been uh, you know, submerged a little bit in the last year or two, but that's DACA and Dreamers, uh, which is also a huge issue uh, in concerning immigration. And I'm gonna start this by telling you a story. I used to be a high school English teacher. I used to teach 10th grade English and English is a second language, right? And this is around 2000, 2001 when I was teaching. And one day I noticed that one of my ESL students' older sisters kept coming into my office or my classroom. I'm a professor now, so I always talk about offices, whatever. And, she, and I, I never had her in class, but she just kept kind of hanging out, kind of lurking, wanting to talk about things. And then, you know, I noticed this for like two or three weeks. And then one day I was like, Araceli, why? Why, why are you coming around here? What's, what's going on? Is, is something bothering you? Because I thought maybe she was, she was just like, you know, lost a friend group, maybe wanted to just hang out in a safe space, whatever, I didn't know. And she's like, well, Mr. Muerto, my last name is Bebo, so my students called me Muerto. Um, life, death, lots of homework, you know how it goes. And uh, she's like, Mr. Muerto, I'm graduating. I'm like, yeah, it's so awesome. She's like, I'm in all these honors classes. I'm like, yeah, I know. She's like, I can't go to college. And I was like, what? Because you know, here I'm this like white dude teaching ESL, but I don't know about the experiences of, of immigrant communities, right? And it turns out Araceli couldn't go to college because she couldn't take out loans and she'd have to pay out-of-state tuition. Um, and this is around the same time that the DREAM Act uh, was put forth in Congress. And the DREAM Act, the original iteration of it, and it's had n multiple iterations, was to give immigrant children who were undocumented, who came because of their parents, give them citizenship or a pathway to citizenship uh, so that they could do things like go to college, get a job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at that time, my, my now wife, then girlfriend, uh, was researching immigration and uh, She's also the child of immigrants. And so I put Araceli in contact with her and we got her into a junior college. But Araceli's story is not unique by any stretch of the imagination. I saw some of my best students get married, work under the table jobs, et cetera, et cetera, when they could have had much more economically lucrative lives had they had pathways. The DREAM Act has gone back and forth over the last 24 years. Um, and eventually, we have this policy known as DACA, right? But it's temporary. It's under contestation. I'm sure Ian could talk about that uh, extensively because of his work on the Supreme Court. 
Um, but DACA is not a law, and DACA allows children of a, people who came here as children within a certain time frame to have temporary legal status, right? But I also know relatives who are adults who, one of them's literally got his master's degree in astrophysics uh, from a, a, a university in the United States, but he's not eligible for DACA because he came here when he was 14 or, or 12, but it was like in the late 80s or early 90s, right? And so we have this, I wanna say untapped potential, but I'm actually kind of grossed out by that, that phrase. Uh, but we have this untapped potential. We have these folks who are our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our in-laws, our neighbors, or whatnot. And we have policies in place that might help some, but political intransigence has stopped the DREAM Act from coming to uh, fruition. And I should note that the vast majority of Americans support a pathway to citizenship for people who came here as children. And if that's the case, then it's, I think what Ian was gesturing towards earlier, it's actually the political tr intransigence of not wanting to give another side a win that is stopping those folks from being able to live their dreams. So that's my, my spiel on, on DACA and the DREAM Act. I can talk more about the history of the border going back 150 years if we want to. Um, but those are, two policy, uh, those are two areas that are at the front and center of immigration policy today. What's happening with the migration crisis, uh, with people coming in claiming asylum status, and what do we do with contributors to our country who are being either offered a hand, but it's a very tenuous hand in DACA, it could go away at any moment, or um, are, are not even offered that. Thank you. Rebecca? Um, okay, yes, I'm here. Um, I think one thing I'm interested to discuss with my co-panelists, I think that there are few issues on which fake news and alternative facts have had a more significant effect uh, than immigration and the southern border and conversations about immigration reform and border security. Um, and also few, issue, few issues in which the, an artificial distance has been created as effectively. Um, as has been the case with dialogue and discussions around security at the southern border. Uh, there are also few issues in which the intersection of some of the ugliest things that are happening in the United States today uh, come together, from sexism to homophobia to racism, colorism. Um, Ian said that the credible fear screening is a low bar. Uh, it should be to seek asylum. And unfortunately, it's not always. Um, and so there are just, I mean, myriad problems. And I, I also, I realize this is, would take us further afield. Um, but this is a topic on which I think we benefit by considering what our practices are, what the situation is in the United States as compared with other countries and thinking about asylum as a human right and under international law. Um, and I'll conclude by saying I'm here with you today. My family is here in the United States because my grandfather was able to seek asylum. Um, and it's critical that we not um, forget the human dimension uh, to what's happening at the border. Uh, I'm also very interested, panelist to my left, Brandon, to talk about, um, I, for me, faith comes into immigration in a really significant way. Um, the first question in the Bible is, am I my brother's keeper? And, the loss of 
the consideration of uh, asylum as a moral issue um, is something that I regret and hope we can reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca, Brandon? Now I feel like I have to give a sermon or something. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> So I'm a, I'm a philosopher, I'm a trained philosopher. I'm not bragging, by the way. That's not something to necessarily be proud of. Um, and I'm, I'm going to leave the, the policy questions to my much uh, abler um, uh, panelist here. I, I want to ask a, a philosophical question, which is, um, when may a society restrict immigration? seems to me there are three broad options. Uh, one option is um, that a society may never restrict immigration. In other words, uh, either there shouldn't be borders, or if there are borders, they should be totally open. I suspect most of us don't have that view. Um, you know, there's probably a half a billion people in the world right now who would move to the U.S. tomorrow if they could. Imagine a totally open borders policy, you know, in Israel or Vatican City. Uh, those places wouldn't last very long. The other uh, extreme view is that there, uh, a society uh, may restrict immigration for any reason whatsoever. In other words, uh, to have closed borders. I suspect most of us don't have that view either. So there's this wide swath of views in the middle that some immigra uh, immigration restrictions are sometimes justified. And so here's the question, uh, which ones? When may a society restrict immigration? And let me just give you a very quick argument. Um, I suspect most of us in this room uh, have a, a sort of disgust reaction to what you might call uh, colonizing or colonization. Um, so let's imagine uh, millions of rich Western white Europeans or progressives from the Northeast, or if you don't like that, we can pick some poor whites from Appalachia who have decided uh, to move to, you know, they, they love the beaches in Honduras or the Ivory Coast, and they've decided to um, move there, uh, buy up all the land, uh, eventually they become citizens, they change the cultural norms, they change the laws, they change the language. In other words, they've colonized these places. And the question I have for you is, what's wrong with that? Um, so here's the simple argument. If you are against peaceful colonization, I suspect you are in favor of more immigration restrictions than you think you are. Thank you, Brandon. I'd like to remind all of you that if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and one of our producers will bring you a card. Um, would anyone like to riff off of what they heard uh, from your other panelists? I, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to chime in. I, I'm fascinated with, with Brandon's um, way of thinking about it as we have these three options broadly construed. And like the real question is when and how do we restrict immigration? So I teach in an English department. Half of my PhD is in history, half of it's in English. So I'm gonna take this like a historian and I'm gonna think about periodization here. Um, I do a lot of research on anti-immigrant discourse. Uh, so, you know, some of my articles have focused on folks like Pat Buchanan, Peter Brimelow from the 1990s. They're, they're still alive and kicking and writing today, but their, their main arguments were coming out of the 1990s. And they don't think about it in that abstract way of do we set uh, limits or do we not, but rather when those thinkers are thinking about immigration restrictions, they're thinking about it in terms of the demographic makeup of the United States. So I said earlier we could talk about the long history of the border. One of the things we should probably recognize is that to immigrate into the United States and to become a citizen, up until the early 20th century, you had to be white. So there was a racial restriction on immigration and naturalization 
into the United States. There's a caveat there we can talk about. Mexicans were con legally classified as white sometimes, not always. We can get into the weeds of it. I say that because we have seen large anti-immigrant discourse tick up post-1965 when the immigration quotas were eradicated in the United States. So we used to have national origin immigration quotas. X number of people from this country, X number of people from that country, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have folks who say, we're gonna make restrictions because we want to go back to an earlier time period. And they use the discourse of colonization. They use the discourse of colonization that America, its culture is under threat. If you read Peter Brimelow's Alienation, he talks in the first few pages about social welfare programs and offices being overrun by black and brown people. And it's a racial threat. He's evoking this fear of colonization as, oh my God, the American character is gonna change and we need to go back to the 1910s. But what is that American character that Brian Lowe or Buchanan or others are talking about? It's a largely white America. And so do we wanna live in a multiracial society? Or do we want to go back and hold on to an ethnic character of the country that has honestly long passed? Or do we want to keep the political intransigence that we have today? And by not allowing some people to become citizens, allow them to have a second class status and codify that second class status by law. So I think the discourse of colonization is really revealing. And I'm not saying that that's what Brandon is getting at, but the discourse of colonization is what is, ha is, is, what is pushing a lot of the bills. Uh, in 2010, we passed in Arizona HB 2281. It was the Show Me Your Papers bill. We also passed an anti-ethnic studies bill uh, 4437, HB 4437, I think is what it was. I don't know, it was 1070 and 2281. 4437 was the Sensenbrenner bill. When we passed that bill, it was done in part because local activist groups were influencing politicians by saying, the Mexicans are coming. They are coming and they are trying to conquer the United States. There is going to be a reconquest of the US Southwest. I can point you to uh, testimony about this. I can, te I can point you to uh, records. I can, I've written articles on this. It's a conspiracy theory. So I go back to Rebecca and your comment about fake news. This fake news is not new. These conspiracy theories have been around for a while. I can point you to a great book, actually two of them, by Leo Chavez. The, uh, the Latino Threat is one of them. It's part of, it deals with that conspiracy theory a little bit. And the other one is Covering Immigration, how we have talked about immigration for the last hundred years uh, through popular media. And both of them talk about this threat where Latinos are seen as this racial, ethnic other that is going to contaminate the United States. That discourse has poisoned our politics. I'd like to make two quick points. One is I think there's some weird language creep going on here around the word colonialism. Like the reason we object to colonialism, like the British did not show up in India and say, we would like to work in your fields And we would like for our children to eventually be integrated into your society on equal terms with other Indian citizens. Yeah. That is not what colonialism is. You know, you know, colonialism is a taking. You know, you know, colonialism is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is the use of superior force. 
in order to in order to displace the rights of the people who are already in the nation that you are immigrating into. Um, that is not what we are talking about here. Um, the second point I want to make is simply that I am interested in the fact that Brandon or, or no one else has made an economic argument. Um, like, you know, there, there are traditionally two arguments that are made against increased immigration. You know, one is the cultural argument. It will, it will, it will change our culture. Um, the other is that this will have negative economic effects. And I mean, I, I will respond briefly to the, you know, to the straw man that I am now going to be. But, you know, I, I will respond briefly to the, to the economic argument and say, the challenge with immigration is that in the short term, it does produce a lot of economic difficulties. If you have, you know, thousands of people show up in a town that doesn't yet have housing for them. Um, you know, in the short term there are, but if you get over those short, those, those, those short term difficulties, tremendous economic benefits. I mean, the, the, the CBO is we're predicting, I, I think something like an additional 1% of GDP or, or something like, because of the migration crisis. You know, so you know, because eventually these folks are, are are going to integrate into our into our economy. Some of them will start businesses. They'll pay taxes, um, and so you know, with the with respect to the economic argument, you know, maybe the reason we are hearing the cultural argument more is because over the long term, the the economic the the economic argument really really doesn't work. But like, if, if we're going to make the cultural argument, I, I mean, let, let, let's talk about what, what we are actually talking about here. You know, we are not talking about something akin to colonialism. You know, what we, what we are talking about is that some people will come into our, into our country, they or maybe their children will eventually integrate on, equal, on the terms of political equality. They have the same rights that, any, that, that, anyone, that, that, that anyone else in, the, in, in this room has. And I, I mean, maybe you object so much to the fact that there might be a, like, a Latin grocery store on the corner that that, 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 that troubles you. But I, I, I mean, I, I think it's important that we speak of this in a way that, is, you know, that, 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 that that describes the scale of the situation and doesn't compare it to something like, for example, what the British did in India. So I asked two questions. One was, what is the moral principle by which a society may restrict immigration? Um, didn't hear any answers to that. Um, and the other question, I guess this, this was implicit, when, when may Ugandans restrict millions of Americans moving in when may Hondurans restrict millions of Americans moving in, buying up the hotels and land, slowly, slowly changing the laws? I didn't, I didn't say anything about this happening in America. The question was a general moral principle. When may a society restrict immigration? And insinuations of racism are not an answer to that question. Rebecca, any thoughts? Uh, before, I do have a couple of questions here, uh, but if you'd like to. Uh, no, I'm interested to hear the questions, actually. OK. Uh, the first question comes from a student, and this uh, ties into what you were talking about, Lee. Despite being generally used as a political tool, Latinos tend to lean towards the conservative side, which vilifies them. Huh. Is there an explanation for this phenomenon? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'll just caution by using the, the term Latino in, in an umbrella, as an umbrella term in the, when we talk about politics. Like, Cuban immigrants tend to be very conservative. Uh, I mean, I'm actually, like, Republicans are kind of, we're seeing a huge influx of immigrants fleeing the very oppressive left-wing Madero regime for, in Venezuela. And immigrants from societies that have, have left-wing dictators tend to vote for Republicans. And so it was actually in the Republican Party's interest to let any Venezuelan who wants to come in, come in, because, you know, Vietnamese immigrants also, also tend, to, um, tend to vote for Republicans because many of them came over here because they were fleeing Ho Chi Minh. Um, but, like, 
Mexican immigrants, I mean, it's, the polls show that they're, that, 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 they're, that they're some shift, but like Mexican immigrants tend to favor Democrats. So like we, we are talking about many people from many different cultures who like, you know, they share some physical characteristics and many of them speak the Spanish language. But like you, you know, we are talking about diverse cultures, some of which tend to vote for tend tend to vote for Republicans when they when they immigrate into the United States, some of which tend to vote for Democrats. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to that, and I think that that point about Latino is a homogenizing term that kind of erases these things. Um, in in your discussion about the where they're coming from, and and the political conditions from which they're they're arriving. It makes a lot of sense. The other thing I would add is also generation, right? So like first, second, third generation Mexican Americans lean more democratic. Um, people whose ancestors have been in the, in the United States before it was the United States, uh, people in South Texas, eh, they're still lean democratic, but maybe not as much as a place like LA, right? So there's those, those dynamics as well. Um, but I wanna go back to, you know, I remember hearing in 2000 uh, that George W. Bush had won the Latino vote. And he did in the sense that he got like 30, 35%. It's because the, the expectations were really low. Um, and it's just a really diverse political group. So, yeah. Rebecca, any, would you like to add some thoughts? Uh, yes. Um, and of course, it's a, uh, Puerto Rico is never far from my mind. Um, so in all of this, I'm also sort of thinking, uh, you know, if you know anything about Puerto Rico, then nothing that's happening in our southern border should be surprising to you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Puerto Rico comes to mind in the context of this question. Uh, in 2008, I spent the last month or so of the presidential campaign when I was working uh, for the Democratic National Committee uh, in Florida and observed firsthand something that I had already uh, become acquainted with through uh, polling and analytics, um, which is the dynamics of Latino communities in Florida and voting patterns. Um, and as someone who knew very little about Florida specifically before I came, I was shocked to find there were a ton of Puerto Ricans voting Republican. Mm -hmm. um, and more than that, really identifying with the Republican Party. Um, why? Because Republicans showed up. Because Republicans invested in community relations, in talking to people, um, Puerto Ricans along the I-4 corridor, and had developed relationships for the last 30 years that were informing the decisions that people were making. Um, so, yes, I think it's just there's, um, and I appreciate the, presumably, maybe I'm the only Latino on the panel. I love that I, uh, I'm not the only one saying, no, we're not a monolith, because it gets uh, old. <laughs> um, generational effects are huge. Language effects are huge. Whether you still speak Spanish with your family, uh, the language you speak at home, the language in which you consume news. Um, but a lot of these things come down to the simplest thing, which is the relationship building and the community engagement and all of that. But it is a powerful lesson, too, that there's a problem with Republican Puerto Ricans from the perspective of the Democratic Party in Florida, um, which Obama won that year. And I think we have a sense that that wouldn't happen uh, again this year. Um, so I'll pass the mic. I've got a question from the audience that I would like any of you to take. And maybe you can start, Brandon, since you haven't uh, spoken in the last few minutes. Regardless of which side of the aisle that you're on, do you think that the current state of the border is acceptable or sustainable, and does it pose a threat? Uh, no and yes. <laughs> Would you care to add to that a little bit? No, I'm actually more curious to hear what my, what my panelists uh, think about that. 
I'll, I'll, I'll jump on. I, I mean, is it sustainable? No. And the, the reason why it is not sustainable is because it is very unpopular and we live in a democracy. And you know, it doesn't really matter what I think if I'm outvoted. Um, it, it, is it a threat? I, 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 I mean, again, like, what do you perceive as the threat? You know, if, if the threat that you perceive is that our economy cannot absorb th this many migrants, I mean, I've already responded to that concern. If your concern is that we don't have enough land for them to move, like, have you been to Nebraska? Like, <laughs> um, you know, if, but if your concern is that, if, if your concern is that, like, these are folks who are culturally distinct from many Americans, and you want, you know, a, a America to say cult culturally stagnant, you know, I, I'm not even going to bring race into this. I'm just going to say that under, under any circumstances, that's a losing battle. You know, you may have noticed that the youths have different values than those of us who are old. We're going to lose that fight. You, 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 you don't get to keep your culture. It, 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 it's always going to change. There's always going to be, be, be people, regardless of what your immigration rates are, and especially in an era where we're, so, where we're so interconnected. So even if you don't have people from other cultures coming into the United States, we're still listening to their music. We're still consuming you know, their pop culture. The culture's just going to change. You know, and if your goal is to keep it the same, I, I'm sorry. Like, you're you, you, you just not going to win. I do want to just uh, respond to Ian very briefly. So I, I think that the empirical evidence is not as um, obvious and one-sided as he is leading you to believe. Uh, so just for example, there's an economist, Garrett Jones, um, there's a recent book called The Culture Transplant. He looks at lots of data around the world. And his thesis is that um, migrants make the economy they move to more like the economy they came from. Um, and he goes through a bunch of different cases. So now, th does that settle the issue? No, but I, I just want to throw that in there because I think Ian's making it. S hold on a second. I think Ian's making it sound like all of the evidence is sort of one-sided, and I, I just want to um, put that out there. Like, if they're coming from a country with lots of agricultural jobs, they make the country that they move to have more agricultural jobs? Like, like what, what do you mean more like the, the economy that they came from? Uh, well, um, if you're bringing in lots of highly skilled, well-educated individuals, that is going to make the economy move in a certain direction, and you're going to bring in lots of low-skilled, uh, uneducated people that will move the economy in a different direction. I, I mean, I, I guess I'll respond by just conceding the point that I have already made, which is that there are short-term costs to, 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 to increased immigration. I, um, you, you know, you, you, you do have people, who, you know, as I said, they, sometimes you have people moving into, into communities that do not, does not have adequate housing. You know, sometimes, sometimes these are people, you know, it, it just takes a while for them to transition, and there are short, short-term costs. But the longer the horizon, you know, the longer the time frame that you, that you look at, the more positive the economic story becomes. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think there's, you know, yeah, somebody might come in with low, a low skill set, and they might work a low skill set, uh, that's a problematic term, but whatever, uh, job. I have also known migrants who've come in with professional degrees in their countries, and they, because their professional degrees are not recognized, they work in cleaning positions, right? You know, go from an accountant to a cleaner, right? Um, but I'm gonna tell a personal story that I think elucidates that Looking at a migrant coming in is a photograph, and we need to look at a moving picture. My in-laws came here in the late 70s. Uh, my father-in-law passed, but uh, when he was alive and his, and his wife, who's still alive, uh, when, when they came here, they were undocumented. They overstayed their visas. And you could look at that, and you can say, well, you know, she got 
an eighth grade education in Mexico, and he got a little bit more than that. And th those, are, those are economic drains. But he ended up getting a job with General Motors, and a, a union paying job, and he got a, a pretty nice four or five bedroom house in Arlington, Texas. And he had four kids. One of them is working the same job that he had. And I'll be honest with you, she makes more than I do. Um, another is a PR professional for a, for, the, for a local municipality. Another has worked in public safety and public health. And the, the fourth is my wife, and she has a PhD. And she also makes more money than I do. Um, I, you know, I'll complain about my in-laws, but they're not economic drains. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a lawyer, what do I know? But uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, economics are not contagious in the sense of um, folks immigrating and the skill sets they bring shaping. I think that that's kind of actually a backward way to look at it. Um, but I wanted to return to the question of whether the southern border, the immigration crisis, is a national security issue. And that leads me back to the sort of fake news dimension. And so, is there a threat? Could there be a threat? Sure. What's the bigger threat? The tens of thousands of attacks on Arizona's voting system that are occurring electronically every day. What are the real threats? It's, you know, the port cities that are actually not adequately monitored and the ships that are coming in and out, but it's not people seeking asylum at the southern border. Um, and um, I'm, I'm also reminded, I'm getting flashbacks. I, uh, imagine some of you are familiar with the work of Samuel Huntington, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, who was the uh, progenitor yes, of the clash of civilizations idea, and whose last book, if I recall before his death, was Who Are We? Mm -hmm. And all in the vein of how uh, Latino immigrants were going to destroy American culture. Um, and, you know, first, culture is just not that fragile. Uh, second, if it were going to happen, it already would have. Um, and the third thing about that is just how ironic it is to come from, I mean, he would self-identify, I'm sure, as a part of the white Protestant uh, American notion of what it is to be American. Um, but the appropriation of black culture, especially in the arts, but across the board that has occurred in the United States literally since black people were forced here um, as slaves um, and from indigenous cultures makes it all the more ridiculous to say that there's some threat by uh, allowing folks to seek asylum. Um, and I, I took a seminar with Samuel Huntington. Uh, so my very short story is, um, as a freshman at Harvard, I saw that this man who was positing that my family was part of the downfall of the United States and that we were perpetrating um, this crime against the country. He was teaching this seminar, it was a graduate level seminar, but I showed up and I asked to participate because I thought, well, I, you know, I guess, <laughs> if you're going to be at Harvard, like, follow up. Um, and his, he, I made my case for inclusion, and he said, well, when did your family get here? And I said, uh, well, my grandmother arrived in 1954, and he said, oh, then you're okay. <laughs> Can I make one more point about the national security? So, like, if we are out-competed by China, the reason will not be because China provides a better lifestyle to its average citizen. Mm. The reason will, like, in China right now, there are about 15 to 20 percent of the Chinese population is living at an American lifestyle. It's just that there's so many people in China that 20 percent of the Chinese population is almost able to achieve economic parity with, 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 with the United States. Like, having people is itself an enormous geostrategic advantage. 
you know, the, the reason why, and actually I, I was wrong when I said that the CBO, I just looked up the number when I said that the CBO said that um, the GDP would increase by 1%, they said it would increase by 2%. Over, over the course of the next 10 years, about um, zero point, about 0 0.2 percent per year, um, and of course that compounds. Um, and the reason why is that when you have more people, you know, some of them start business, others go to work for those businesses. You know, eventually they fully integrate in, in, into the economy, and that makes our economy bigger, mm -hmm. in addition to being stronger. And a bigger economy is a strategic asset because, uh, uh, again, if China beats us, it's not because they're doing a good job of building an economy that works for all Chinese people. They're doing a terrible job of that. It's because there are so many people in China that they do not need to have the economic opportunities and political equality that, that we have in the United States. If they have, a, if they have an upper middle class that, that expands from 20 to 25 percent of their, their, their population, they will outcompete us. More Americans are an asset in, in, this glo in, in, in the new Cold War that we are likely to enter into in the 21st century. I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions from the audience, if that's okay. Um, there were uh, two questions about the role of the US in political destabilization of some Latin American countries. Um, and one about NAFTA and how that could have de destabilized uh, Mexico. Um, any comments about that? And then one other thing that uh, two people have commented on and asked questions about is the role of climate change in immigration. And I'll invite any of you to jump in. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I, I, I was jotting down when Ian was first talking about the history of the border is like, uh, we should probably also think about NAFTA. Um, and right after NAFTA took place and people thought it was going to be great, you know, economic, uh, money and, and goods move back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was an increase in, in migration. Um, Milpas and other rural communities in, in Mexico really suffered. Um, and at that same time, the Clinton administration, uh, and this is where you'll, you'll see that I'll, I'll bash Democrats, um, the Clinton administration instituted a series of policies. One was Operation Gatekeeper. The other one was Operation Hold the Line. Gatekeeper was in the California area. Uh, Hold the Line was in Texas. And it was basically saying, okay, we're getting these large influxes of migrants coming across in urban spaces, like around Tijuana or, uh, I guess we'll call them Nogales urban. Uh, that's, that's Arizona, but you know, uh, places like uh, Brownsville. And so what they did is they militarized the border in those spaces. And they said, well, we won't really militarize the Arizona desert, known as the Devil's Highway. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Luis Alberto Urrea about NAFTA and the Devil's Highway, the desert. Um, and you know what happened? Migrants still came. And they died. And they're still dying in the desert, right? Um, and the book that Urrea writes is about, um, about I think, 27 migrants who come across and, and 14 of them die. Uh, and that was in the summer of 2001. And it was a national outrage. There was push for the DREAM Act at that time. There was push for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, September 10th, 2001, Vicente Fox was in the United States to push for immigration reform. Something happened that next day that transformed immigration, not into a national security issue, because it wasn't, at least not on the southern border, but it changed it in the minds of the American people. Um, and so I think, I, I'm feeling a little bit discombobulated with this statement here, but I think we need to think about how NAFTA destabilizes economies, how other um, economic 
efforts have historically done that in Latin America. Also, the flow of guns south, the flow of uh, the, uh, the desire for drugs here in the United States. These have destabilized these countries, right? Uh, the gangs that, uh, that Ian mentioned, some of those gangs formed in the United States and were deported to El Salvador and other countries, right? Where they metastasized. So it is an international challenge. Um, but creating the border and militarizing the border the way it is today, I don't think it makes a danger to the United States, but it puts the lives of those migrants in danger. Over a quarter of the women who come across on the trains, they're riding on the outsides of trains from Central America up to the United States, over a quarter of them will be raped. Most of them will be robbed. Some of them will have, some of the migrants, men and women and children, will have horrible injuries. Not just because they're beaten, but because they're riding on the outsides of freight trains. And what happens when you fall? You die, you lose a limb, et cetera, et cetera. So going back to Ian's comments earlier about we don't have enough judges, we don't have enough things to process asylum uh, seekers, we need a more robust legal immigration system. When we have a more robust legal immigration system, the undocumented immigration will fall. But because we don't have that, we're fighting a losing battle because we're just militarizing the border and more people are dying. I've got another question and then we've got 10 minutes left to this panel. so. Um, I'd like each of you to comment on this and then maybe uh, make some summarizing comments about your thoughts. And I'm gonna pick on you first, Brandon. Uh, first, a statement, uh, it says, uh, uncontrolled immigration is a quote unquote taking, albeit smaller per capita, reducing resources, land, water, and quality of life. If there is no point at which we restrict immigration, like past quotas, to conserve resources and mitigate the above taking? Not sure I followed that. Would you mind reading that again? Yeah, the comment is that unstopped immigration is a taking um, of resources, of land, of water, of quality of life for people who I guess are existing here. And the question is, is there at no point that we should restrict immigration, like we have in the past with quotas, to conserve resources and mitigate this perceived taking? Hmm. Sorry, whoever's question that was. That was so earnest, but I'm not sure I follow. Um, let me say something maybe in the neighborhood. This is what I do with, in class when I don't understand the question. <laughs> just kind of wing it. Um, and it comes back to this question about moral principles. Under what conditions does the society have the right to restrict who shows up? Uh, it's a very difficult question. I'm not pretending like it's an easy question. Um, of course, a lot of people could live in Nebraska that aren't currently living there. That's absolutely true. That doesn't answer the moral question. That doesn't answer the question of um, when other people are allowed to, um, to show up. And one worry you might have about this, and this is, comes from a paper by a, a philosopher friend of mine, Rishikesh Joshi. Uh, the title of the paper is, Is Liberalism Committed to Its Own Demise? I'll say that again. Is Liberalism Committed to Its Own Demise? So suppose you have a very liberal immigration policy, uh, basically for any reason whatsoever, as long as someone's not a criminal, they're, they're allowed to immigrate. Um, there are conceivably lots of situations in which millions and millions of illiberal people will show up in your liberal society. People with very different views about women's rights, homosexuality, dress, language, cultural norms. And this is part of Garrett Jones' point about the culture transplant. Um, so this, this has nothing to do with the southern, southern border. So I want you to abstract away and just think about moral principles. Um, is a liberal border policy committed to the possibility of allowing so many illiberal people that the society is no longer liberal? 
And you might think, as a good liberal, you want to preserve liberal societies. It's good to preserve liberal societies. And uh, perhaps paradoxically, one thing that might require is uh, restricting immigration. Sorry, that doesn't answer your question, but it's just a thought. OK, we've got time for about two minutes apiece. Rebecca? Um, sure. I mean, I, I just wanted to sort of respond to, uh, again, in the neighborhood, uh, a good phrase. But um, I guess my philosophical question would be, um, what moral principle uh, under which we could say that we have the right to restrict mm. the use of the resources in question? Because, I mean, and who's the we here? Um, but we began this panel with the, the indigenous land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, wh what is the moral principle that says that we have any right to restrict these resources um, that those of us, you know, in this room at this moment, I mean, it's, we weren't born with them. We didn't, you know, come into them. In fact, they were taken by violence. Um, so that's the, the moral taking question that uh, I would be more interested in. Um, and thank you all for being here. Yeah, I, I, like to, I like this idea of thinking about moral principles in this, maybe in a slightly different direction. Um, how long does it take to migrate to the United States legally from a country in Latin America? How long is the wait? It's about 20 years, maybe more. So, question for you. You want your child to have a roof that works in the house that you live in. Or you have a child that needs medical care. Or you just want a better life for your child. Or you want your child to be able to eat. Or maybe you're under threat of gangs or narco violence because of drug demand. How long do you wait? How long do you wait for your child? Or do you go pay somebody an astronomical wage in hopes that you can survive and your child can survive? So, I guess what I'm asking you to think about is what is the moral imperative of the migrants who are coming over and put yourself in their shoes? So two thoughts. Um, one is like if I can respond I guess to Brandon's original question. I think my answer would be different if we were Ireland. Mm. So Ireland is a very wealthy country. It's actually wealthier than us on a, on a per capita basis. Um, they're an island nation. And so Ireland recently changed its laws to be much more restrictive to wealthy immigrants. Um, it used to be you could simply buy Irish, uh, you could simply buy lawful permanent residency in Ireland for 500,000 euros. They recently changed the law, you can't do that anymore. And the reason why is because um, they are afraid of what has happened to many Caribbean nations, where wealthy people show up and they buy up so much land that you, know, you, you just have these enormous estates owned by, owned by very wealthy people and there isn't enough land to go around. I, I, I don't see that as a risk in the, in the United States of America. And like similarly to Brandon's point about, like, or, or to the, 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 the audience member's point about resources being taken up, I just don't see any empirical, I mean what, what I see in the United States is I see a lot of farms that are where that are underexploited resources because they do not have enough workers. And so like if we at some point in the future reach a point where like we just have all you know where we're stripping all of our resources bare and like we 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 can't produce enough food. I mean maybe I will have a different answer to the question but that ain't where we are. Um and I I guess to this point about liberalism I'll make two points. I mean, one is that, like, th this isn't something new that's happening. We, 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 have, we have had immigrants from Central and South America entering the United States for a really, really long time. I do not see any evidence that they have organized to overturn Obergefell v. Hodges. Um, but, 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 but setting that aside, 
if we are concerned about that fact, we actually have another mechanism that we use to make sure that immigrants have been somewhat in inculcated in our cultural values before we give them the right to vote. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you show up in the United States and, we're, and we do not say, welcome to the United States, here's your citizenship and here's your US passport. It is a difficult process. Um, to, to become a United States citizen, and it involves some teaching and inculcation of, of, of American values. And so if we are concerned that there are immigrants who are coming who do not share values that we want to be part of our political polity, we have another policy mechanism that we can use to deal with that, and that is we can, you know, we can address that in the, process, in, the, in the naturalization process, what you have to do in order to actually gain the, the, the right to vote. And I, you know, I, I just don't see how the mere fact that someone is physically present in the, in the country without full citizenship rights endangers, you know, endangers our political liberties. Thank you, and unfortunately we are at our end time at 1010. I'd like to thank all of you for showing up and thank our panel for a thoughtful, knowledgeable discussion.